in joining us in a moment or two is a guy that with 37 seconds left in the game on Sunday night football, with no timeouts, decided to take over and make some magic happen. Completing passes to Devontae Adams, getting them in range for Mason Crosby to drain a 51-yard field goal to get a massive win in the NFC over the San Francisco 49ers in Santa Clara, California with the North Valley Community Fund receivers in the building and back in his home area, the founder of the Aaron Rodgers Book Club, the current reigning MVP of the NFL, ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah! What's up, dude? Hey, thanks for uh, giving me a few seconds to get situated there with that long intro. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty nice, you know? Zito's back there like, ha, ah, ah. ha. And I'm like, all right, I can say a couple more great things because life is good for this guy. Uh, congratulations on a massive win. That vertical leap you displayed while celebrating after Mason Crosby put that ball through. Life's got to be good right now, huh? You were up like 40 inches, it looked like. Maybe a 50-inch vertical. And you look so cool right now, obviously, in a different place than normal. I'm in the, yeah, I'm in the, the sunroom. I got the, you know, my uh, books behind me here. I thought that was very apropos, considering the, uh, the, the uh, book club that we've been doing. I can see you've uh, at least got a book in your hand. That's good. <laughs> it's the giver, dude. Hey, it's crazy what that one kid got to learn from the giver there. And, That's right. I mean, really, it's free thinking. I loved it, man. This was awesome, dude. This was really good. It is apropos. You're right. It is. It is. <laughs> Uh, but a, a little trick, a little trick for the uh, the vertically uh, jump jumping impaired. If you lift your legs up, it actually looks like you're jumping higher than you actually are. Okay, so let's talk about the jump a little bit. In the bookcase, looks great. The lighting looks fantastic. The flow got oh, good yeah. hang time. Yeah, I got my guitar here. Yeah! Oh, oh my God! I wish I had one. I wish I had one right here. Are you gonna play something? Can you play? Uh, I can play a little bit, but, but no, I'm not going to. That's not what this show's about. <laughs> I mean, it could become that. Honestly, yeah. it's Aaron Rodgers Tuesday. You do whatever the fuck you want to do, pal. If you want to play a little guitar, you do that. But let's talk about the game a little bit. Um, was San Francisco, especially with family, friends, community, people you helped in the building and being from your area of where you're from, is that a game that drew a little bit more excitement and enthusiasm, or is it just, hey, this is a massive win for our team right now, and that's what we got a chance to see at the end of that thing. It was beautiful to see you celebrate like hell with your teammates, your coaches, especially just weeks removed from, oh, this guy doesn't care. You know, that, that, that whole narrative was one that was getting a little bit loud. It was great to see it. Is it San Fran that did that, or is that just a massive game for the team, you think? Well, it's a rough night, I guess, for some of those uh, he doesn't care campers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love the game, man. I love competing. There's nothing like it. There's there's nothing like uh, uh, having the ball in your hands with a chance to win the game uh, late in the game. Uh, that's yeah, you know, that's what we live for. That's what we dream about. We don't dream about you know kneel downs at the end of games. We dream about okay, we got to go down and put the ball. In position, to either win it with a field goal or win it with a touchdown. That's what, that's what you dream about. You know, when I grew up, uh, when I was a young kid, watching the Super Bowl and watching the drive, um, you know, I, that's what I wanted to do: drive your team 92 yards down the field and win a game. Now that was San Fran, so obviously I've been a San Fran. Uh, I was a San Fran fan my entire young uh, life. Uh, so it always is a special place for me to come back to Northern California, but. I don't need any extra motivation or, or inspiration. Uh, it was a measuring stick for our football team, I think, to see how we matched up against uh, against another really good football team, and, and I'm proud of our guys. Hey, did you? Uh, how much time did you think you needed to get down there in field goal range? And also, were you surprised? <laughs> I see Dane Orschlovsky on ESPN freaking out, losing his mind because they snapped the ball with 12 seconds on the play clock down there towards the end. Were you surprised they didn't run that down? Uh, I was considering that we were out of timeouts, but you know, what are you going to do? You know, they throw it to that stud fullback and he breaks a bunch of tackles and scores. Like it wasn't the situation where, well, don't get in, don't get in. You know, it's, it's you know, you got a great defense. You got to trust the defense. Like obviously we need to make a couple plays and still hit a 51 yard field goal. And we got an incredible kicker, uh, who definitely, you know, reps the brand all the time. All the time. Hell yeah. But so still, you know, it's still a difficult kick, and even to get that position, you got to hit uh, hit a couple chunk plays, and, and 
not have any penalties and, and clock on time. So, look, you know, I, I think no one's to fault uh, on, on their side, especially not Juice. I mean, he's, you know, bowling people over, running a little choice route, getting in the end zone. Um, but, you know, if you if you play – if you play not to lose, you lose. You usually lose those games, you know. And, and playing to win is always the win, you know what I want to be a part of. And I don't think they they have anything to be upset about. Okay, so let's talk about that last drive. And then you talked about Mason Crosby there, who oh gee, dude. By the way, he has been bombing balls for so long. I don't know how, I don't know why, but I'm so impressed by it. He's unbelievable. But as soon as you kill that after the two incredible plays. Devontae's is a stallion, by the way. I don't know how the hell he continues to be even better. And just you two playing football together is so much fun. But as soon as you clock that, your celebration, like, yeah, I know Mason's going to make it. Like, I bet you Mason saw that and really felt like my guy's got me. You know, like, that is that's a really cool moment that AJ and I chatted about yesterday, but I don't think a lot of people saw. As soon as you killed that thing, especially in the state of the world we're in with kickers, you go, and yeah, we just did it, and then him burying it, even though he bent it around a guy, which is fucking awesome. But that was just, that was a really cool moment for the brand. I want to let you know that. I appreciate that a lot. And I'm sure Mason does as well. Well, I have a lot of confidence in him. I should. He's proven it time and time again. Uh, he's made a lot of big kicks over his career. I remember his first game winner his rookie year against Philadelphia at home in 2007. I was a backup, and, you know, he just had a good feeling about the, the temperament of the guy and, and the attitude and the confidence that he had, and nothing really rattles him. And the only time you can rattle him is get him on the golf course a little bit, start piping it past him. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, man, you know, it maybe wasn't my favorite game winner. My favorite was probably against the Cowboys in the divisional playoff when he made it twice. If you remember, he made it the first time. This in '16, and then he, uh, you know, he was hitting a cut that day, so he, you know, hit a little cut in there off the left upright. Then he put it outside the left upright and just snuck it in there. That was really special, just because of what we went through that 2016 season. Um, but this one for sure will always be special. Uh, the way that game went, the ups and downs, the calls both ways, and oh. and then to to have no timeouts and to be able to put us in position. Devonte, you know, the Undertaker coming out of the, <laughs> <laughs> uh, was was pretty amazing. Even I was surprised when I saw him on the field. I mean, I was standing over there when he went down, and, and he kind of gave me the you know the thumbs up, which which usually means. Okay, I can feel my arms and legs. I am not. I don't have any paralysis, so I'm like, okay, good. Because as a quarterback, you know, that's your biggest fear for sure is laying out one of your buddies. You know, especially a guy like Devonte, who I love so much and have so much respect for. Um, so I didn't see, expect him to come back on the field. When I saw him jog on the field, I was like, Jesus, John Wayne over here, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, it was pretty cool. Go ahead, Pat, play something. Okay. I mean, I Thanks. learned this one uh, way back in the day. Mm-hmm. I'm happy I'm taking requests. Uh, I'll, okay. I'll begin this thing. Uh, you just let me know what you want to hear next, all right? And uh, thank you all for coming out. I think it's open three. Wow. Oh, shit, dude. <laughs> Are you kidding me, bro? Let's go. Bro, I fucking did. And then. Spider-Man. Yep. <laughs> Boom. Hey, I'm a fucking... Huh? Hi, am I not? This is my dad's guitar. I, I fucked it up hey, for sure. Hey, smoke on the And I normally have the... Pick. Yeah, that's it, dude, right? Oh. Is that not it? Damn. Yeah. Is that not it? That's amazing, yeah. Can you actually play? I remember when you were younger, you did some Fox interview and you were like sitting on a beach that was and, you, sweet. and you, were, you were doing the full strum. And then now, obviously, on the State Farm commercial with Jake's dumbass giving your rate off to everybody. I mean, can you actually play? Have you ever gone up in like on a stage at like a uh, maybe a uh, Howl at the Moon or like a uh, dueling piano place? I did a, uh, an open mic, a couple of songs. This is years and years and years ago with. Uh, with Brett Good, our longtime long snapper, we we used to, you know, have our Fridays where we'd uh, drink some brown liquor and uh, play some guitar, uh, oh, yeah. and and we decided for whatever reason to play this open mic. This is I don't know. This is about twelve years ago, maybe. Is this and Green Bay? This is in Green Bay. Yeah, we went down there, you know, and you sign up or whatever. So we, you know, we were gonna play a couple songs, and he kind of froze. 
be honest with you. Like we played a couple. We I mean we practiced for a few weeks too, and you know when you're maybe when you're drinking everything sounds a little bit better, I guess, but. But we went in there and we struggled. <laughs> Did you get booed out? I mean, they had to know who you were, right? Immediately upon no, your... No, we didn't get booed out, but we started our last song and Brett couldn't do it. So I said, hey, man, I got it. So Oh! Out, and I did a little uh, Ben Harper forever to kind of bring it home. Never what, what did Brett do? Did he just slowly walk off the stage while you played the song? <laughs> I think he bellied up to the bar. <laughs> oh, good. Hey, hey going to your, you were talking about, uh, Pat and I were talking about LeFleur earlier. You ever feel like you may be bullying him a little bit with this position you're in? Whenever you get juiced, you just sock him and forearm him in the chest and hit him in the neck and just mess around. I know it's all in good fun, but technically he can't really hit you back, and he, you deserve to get smacked a few times. How, how, <laughs> how heavy-handed you are. <laughs> yeah, you know, Matt likes that real intimate hug, you know, kind of where you hold and then look at each other. And I'm more like, you in my space, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not trying to like hug and then like talk it out close. Like, man, come on, just dab me up and let's move on. Come on. How are you with How are you with the offense? How are you with Lafleur? I mean, this was a big one for him too against Kyle, I guess. And there was the cold handshake or whatever. And who knows if that was just two friends being mad at each other? I'm sure that's been addressed. But how was it for? You know, him to get this a big win. San Francisco has been a nemesis. I mean, it has been here for a bit. This is a massive win. How has LaFleur been? How's your relationship? And how do you feel about the offense right now? Yeah, I don't think anybody's seen him. I mean, he's been on a on a bender the last couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, Matt. Matt's a grinder, man. I'm sure he put that thing to bed you know, on the plane. He probably stayed up the entire plane ride. We landed like 5.30 in the morning, you know. Walking out there, it's like damn paparazzi. You're walking off the plane. Now, I love it. I mean, I love seeing the fans at the airport, but it's like 5:30. I haven't been able to even slept. It's hard to sleep on those planes. Um, and you know, walking off, and it's like people clapping and people taking pictures. I think people just got in the airport. Some of them were for flights, and I'm like, you know, baggy eyed, can't even, you know, st- you know, staggering around there, haven't slept, you know, hardly at all on the flight, uncomfortable, hungry. Um, but I'm sure Matt was. Uh, you know, put that film to bed and was on to, to Pittsburgh pretty quick. Now, you know, we were all happy, and, and some games mean a little bit more than others. I'm sure when you go against your former boss, it does, and then have an icy handshake after, you know, after a win, I'm sure that feels a little bit better. What is that icy handshake? Do you ever have any any uh, opponents where you weren't really sure how the interaction was going to go after? You know, you always go talk to the opposing quarterback. You always seem like you're, you're best buds with them. You ever have any interactions after a game that you're like, oh, this guy a little more serious than I thought? I haven't. No, I haven't. I really haven't. I mean, there's been a couple where you might have some strife with another guy on the other team during the game, but uh, usually after the game, it's you either don't talk to him or, you know, it's squashed. It's like, oh, that was heat of the moment. You know, you dap each other up and then you you, know, you move on. So I, I haven't really had any any of those on the field. The cops like walk it. with you, too. Cops walk with the head coach and the quarterback. Yeah, usually too, so no one's doing it. Yeah, yeah, sure. I got a ton of, yeah, a ton of cops around me, I'm sure. Oh, that's a no. You don't. I guess we have seen you very casual conversation, except uh-oh. for uh oh, except for is that in Dominican Sue saying, "Hey, you're right. We should get past this because I do remember that is a situation that is still potentially, you know, something that exists." I don't know if you guys handled that or not. Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, I never really got necessarily handled, but I, uh, you know, I didn't see him after the game, so I'm sure there's there's not any strife between us. It's a couple of, you know, competitors, savvy businessmen off the field. Nothing but respect for each other. That's all. <laughs> Nothing but respect. Do they, they, all the younger quarterbacks just come up and ask you a bunch of questions? Like, right now, the rookie quarterbacks are swimming in it. I, this last yeah. weekend, I forget what it was, but do young quarterbacks after the game, since I know you don't go out early in the pre warm ups, do, do they take that time to ask questions? Did you ever do that to any quarterbacks, or is that something that's not really like talked about much and doesn't happen on the field? I mean, uh, there's a time and a place. Like, after a game, but this, it's not a lot of like, Q and A stuff. You're usually looking for, uh, for me, you're looking for uh, you know the opposing quarterback, and then maybe the defense coordinator or people you know on the staff, and then friends. You know, and then you're looking for your friends catch up quickly. But it's all quick stuff. You know, it's it's uh, you know it's respect and and uh, well wishes, and then you know, and then you move on. If you, if you see like you know a friend, you might stop and you know might grab. Uh, uh, Evan Siegel to take a picture or something. You know, it's like last week when seeing uh, you know Tim Boyle and Jamal Williams and Jonah you know, Allison. You know, that was definitely uh, 
definitely wanted to, to get a photo with some of those guys. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. So sorry to interrupt. Hi! Did you know at the age of 30, your testosterone levels start dropping 1% per year? Wow! 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 That means you're gonna get fatter, more tired, and lose the strength that you once Hi! had. But no worries, our friends at Roman have the perfect product for you so you can get back to banging weights, banging humans, and living your best life. $15 off right now. Get Roman.com forward slash USA. Back to the action. Hey! Hmm. So I thought, Pat, you had something. <laughs> oh, right. no, I do. Yeah, I actually no, do. No, no, no. No, I'll no, no, no because this, this, this is it. So, so, oh, talk, so like, my thing was, who's somebody you look, who did, who did, like, when you're fucking Aaron Rodgers, everybody talks about you, and I'm sure you have heard this, you've had to have heard this, like, hey, this guy's the greatest ball thrower of all time. This guy is the reigning MVP. There's only a certain amount of people, I assume, that you can go to for any advice. And do you even have that person? When was the last time you had that? Like, we saw you and Tom Brady have a little relationship this offseason with the match happening and hanging around. You guys had a nice little catch. I mean, you guys oh, had yeah. a good catch with each other. Like, is there right. people you... Is there people you could talk to? Is there people throughout your career you think that maybe we wouldn't know, like, hey, helped you out immensely with some tips or advice or anything like that? I think there's a lot of people for sure. I mean, you know, Steve Young has been a, has been a friend and a, and a mentor for a long time, especially younger. When I was younger, I reached out to him, I think after my second concussion in 2010. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to him to alleviate some of the fears I had around uh, around concussions and, and long-term health because I know he was a guy who sustained a number of concussions over his career and, uh, you know, had a bad one at the end of his career. So I reached out and he was fantastic. And since then, you know, we've kept in touch over the years and, and he's, uh, you know, been a great resource when I need him, um, but, but just also just kind of a supportive friend from afar. Um, you know, some other former quarterbacks that I keep in touch with, uh, from time to time as well. Obviously, Farby and I have uh, uh, become good friends uh, over the last few years, especially. Um, but yeah, it's kind of people reach out to me a little bit more, I guess, now than, than I reach out to them. No big it's deal. Fun. No big <laughs> deal. <laughs> no big deal. No big deal. Yeah, people calling. Uh, it's cool to chat with people. Yeah. No big deal. Go ahead, Ty. Aaron, first and foremost, incredible game Sunday night. That was a lot of fun to watch. Something I'll, I'll remember that one for a while. Let's go! Yeah, that big, big win. Um, a lot of people were talking about how the, the first pass to Devontae on that last drive was something you guys came up with during the week in practice. Has that been common through your career? Like, can you think back to, like, these pivotal moments where it was something you guys put in the week prior to the game or the week of the game? Yeah, great question, Ty, as usual. Thank um, you. And a boy, Ty. For a long time in Green Bay, especially when Joe Philbin was around, we used to do this thing on Saturdays, and it was a – two minute uh, against ourselves. So it was the number one offense against um, a bunch of other offensive players, backups, and they would play as a defense. And over the years, I got very competitive. Um, Joe Philbin, uh, you know, got those guys running a bunch of crazy defenses. And it turned into a, a period where we'd work on things, but it was, it was also kind of a bullshit period a little bit um, because we would do two drives, one drive with uh, – you know, the normal guys playing. In the second drive, all the skilled players would play the line, and the line would play the skill positions, and we'd go against them. So it was this big, fun thing Saturdays, right, that got kind of outlawed uh, towards the end of Mike's time and, and Matt's time as people were worried about, you know, O-line getting hurt because they're running 50 yards down the field. Ridiculous, right? Um, just take away all the fun. But the reason I bring this up is because during that first drive, we would always work on certain plays. So I would I would think about plays during the week that I wanted to either make up or see, or maybe something saw on film, or maybe something that I came up with based on another play, and implement them into that Saturday morning two-minute. And during that time, a lot of plays came out of, uh, of those things. I, the, the two most notable, I will say, that, that have helped us, one went all around the league, and that was... Um, that was a three-man side. Number three runs to the flat, and one and two block for him. So the two outside guys block for three runs to the flat. Everybody runs it now. It's a part of every offense. Um, that came up on the Saturday pre-practice, probably in 2011. The first time we ran in the game was in 2012 against Detroit. They played a lot of Tampa 2 in their two-minute, and I hit uh, uh, Jermichael on the right side, so I'd be going on their sideline. He broke it. 
tackle and went about 53 yards. It set us up for uh, the. It was the game winning touchdown I threw to Randall on a on a corner route. But it was set up by that play that came up in this silly pre practice Saturday morning two minutes. The other one is the genesis of the the dash protection, which came in handy in 2016 in a game I mentioned earlier against Dallas, where you know we it was third and 20. Um, we had taken a sack. I called timeout. We ran dash left. Lane Taylor leaked out and blocked uh, Durant, I think it was, and, and gave me enough time to fit the ball into Cookie uh, on the sideline there that set up the game-winning field goal that Mason made twice, once when they called timeout and then the second time that I mentioned before. That protection and the genesis of it uh, came up on the Saturday morning free practice as well. So it's... Sometimes these things that you don't think are that important and people might bullshit through where super impactful plays come out. And I've always taken that approach. Now, we don't do the Saturday morning two-minute anymore, uh, but during our two-minute drill, which is usually Thursdays, I will try and work on uh, different concepts. The initial concept that ended up working on Sunday night was the genesis was in the meeting that morning. Um we all kind of put our heads together and came up with this uh, this play. Now, we adjusted it slightly based on the protection issues that we had. But all in all, it tor- turned into ran around the high corner, Devontae ran a deep end, and, and Mark was on a post in the backside. With the edges protected, thinking based on safety rotation and coverage, I'd have a good chance of hitting somebody. Of course. Yeah, we thought so, too. Like, it, it would never... <laughs> Whenever we were a part of that conversation with you guys, we were like, yeah, that makes sense. Everything you just said, that's going to work completely. Isn't that amazing, though, that whenever you get a bunch of people who know football and are on the same page, you can do shit like that and be like, yeah, we can all be on the same page, especially do it whenever we need it at the biggest moment. I mean, it's unfathomable, the football IQ that you super nerds have. It's unbelievable. (laughs) Go ahead, AJ. You still have to be able to execute those plays that you come up with, but you ever watch other teams like, there's all these young guru hotshot play callers, like offensive play callers in the league. You ever watch other film and did you see, like, I would imagine you guys are picking other, like, you know, everyone recycles plays. Do you see stuff and bring it to the floor and bring it to different people? Say, hey, why don't we do, let's, let's jam this thing in the playbook this week? For sure. And that's the way the league goes. You look around, you look at some of the big plays, uh, and they all get transferred week to week. You know, you see somebody run something. Yeah, I'll give you this example. Week one, we're playing the Saints. They have a fourth and five on like the plus 40-ish going in. And what do they do? They run tight end screen back to the right after they motion the back out left. So what do we do the next week? We're playing Detroit. We got a second and 18. We motion the back out to the left and throw a screen to the right. To Bobby, he hits 22 yards for first down. Um, What did I see last night? I think it was Cowboys. Cowboys had the ball. Get back on track situation. They motioned by there was Pollard out to the left. They threw a screen back to the right. Guy gets, you know, a ton of yards, first down. That's the way this thing goes. Somebody sees something on film that worked, and everybody tries to, to initiate into the game plan. There's a lot less uh, stable, maybe stable isn't the right word, but systems that are rigid in that this is what we're going to do every single week. And we don't, we know if we do what we do better, uh, then you can stop us. It's going to be very efficient. That's how the West Coast offense was. The West Coast offense was not a you know make things up. It was it was not it was not relying on scheme. It was relying on timing and rhythm uh, and proper uh, ball placement. Um, most of the offenses now are heavy scheme offenses, so of course they're going to steal from the latest fads and and try and recycle plays if it fits in your scheme. What did Tom Tom said? It's getting it's like dumbing down the game almost because it's the scheme making plays as opposed to the players having to do it. Do you? Like, it sounds like you agree with that type of thing, right? Yeah, I definitely do. I mean, that's that's uh, that's a scheme. And you know, listen, I think one thing that was interesting that Nick Saban said last night because obviously I was watching Peyton and uh, and Eli and, and wishing that you'd been on there. Oh, thanks, uh, man. It's very nice. But I enjoy I did enjoy uh, you know the guests they had, especially. I mean, I'm a big Chris Long fan, so I, I love having him on there. Oh yeah. He and I know you're a fan as well. Um, he's a good man. But uh, but having Nick Saban on there, the one thing I thought was really interesting that he said was he was talking about college offenses and the fact that nobody huddles anymore. And I, I think, you know, the, the college offenses have been impacting the NFL offenses so much because you're seeing uh, 
quarterbacks and centers, there's just so much less that they do now. You know, uh, from never being in a huddle to never having a live cadence to never making a check or a protection adjustment. The game has definitely changed in that respect. Uh, quarterbacks are asked to do a lot less, I think, now as far as check with me adjustments uh, and protection adjustment, understanding protection. It's, it's, it's so much on is, you know, where's my one, where's my two, where's my three? Instead of, well, I break the huddle, okay, what protection issues do I have on this play? Uh, what adjustments can I make within the protection? And then what, what uh, subtle adjustments to the routes uh, do I need to make in case we get certain coverages? And everything's reactionary now, it feels like, right? Every read is like reactionary. And, and this is not every, I'm broad brushing here, and I shouldn't do that with anything. But a lot of it is you just got like similar reads. And if you get these quarterbacks that are so good at it, and now Lamar Jackson is obviously just an alien, that guy, what he's able to do. But you can see why NFL offenses might want to implement it because it makes the game easier for their rookies and young quarterbacks that they're probably investing in and trying to turn over and everything like that. But long term, do you think it it'll be gone from the game? Do you think there will be a, a less cerebral game long term? Or do you think everything's like cyclical? Do you think somebody will still do like Sarkeesian's down there running an NFL offense in Texas? Arch Manning, I think, although he can run, is going to be a, a, a old school pro style quarterback, I think, with breaking down. Do you think that it, that it would leave the game because of how athletic everybody's becoming and how quick the game's becoming and how the hurry up is basically everything and the RPOs, the D-line has no idea what to do, the running backs or linebackers don't. Do you think that'll that'll become just everything later or do you think that the old school break down the defense, read the defense will always live, you think? I think I think you're gonna see more of that. I think the a lot of the cyclical shifts are due to the rules as well. So if the rules continue to uh, limit physical contact, protect defenseless players and quarterbacks. And uh, the defenseless players part, I think, is very important. But I think some of the hits on quarterbacks that are being called rough in the passer uh, make us way less a part of the physical nature of football that we grew up loving and, and enjoying and being a part of. And I think that's that's kind of a bummer. But you're seeing, you know, as the rules continue to change, uh, you're going to be seeing more college influences. Look at the RPO stuff, and they're trying to crack down a little bit more on linemen downfield, but uh, but until these, you know, and, and also with the, the cut rule, I think it's really uh, adjusted some of the RPOs because receivers, you're not allowed to cut outside the, the tight end box now, you know, five yards on each side of the last scrimmage, um, I believe. So that has changed some of the RPO mindset where you can't just throw it out to the flat, have two guys cut, and now you got, you know, racing away from one guy. Now you got to body up a guy and, and be able to actually block a guy. It's, I think that's swung it back in the defensive favor, which is not exactly a bad thing based on the, all the rule changes that we've had over the, the last uh, half decade, decade. Go ahead, Connor. Yeah, Aaron, in your post-game interview, you were holding a football, and it kind of looked like one of the ones that Pat has on his desk where it was kind of half white. Was that a gift to you, or you were signing one for uh, some of the people in the stands? I take that ball everywhere with me. That's a really special one. Smart. Smart. Yeah, no, that was, that was an NBC Sunday Night Football uh, player of the game uh, panel. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, they, uh, yeah, that's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think I. Oh, you have too fucking many of them. This guy. Yeah. I went over. I went over to. Doesn't have my name on it. Doesn't have my name on it. Yeah, you know, so, like that. What that might have been one to throw in the stands, but. Uh, <laughs> but I kept it. I did, I did keep oh, yeah. it. I definitely kept it. I do appreciate. I do appreciate the nod. Very, very nice recognition for sure, and then a good memory. Um, game balls used to be a lot more prevalent, I think, as far as the ones that the team gave out. I remember, you know, we'd be we gave out a lot of game balls um, in in Green Bay. Every Friday was kind of game ball Friday, so that. Uh, there'd be offensive guys, defensive guys, special teams guys, special recognition balls, and other things, shirts, baseball bat. You know, who knows? We had a lot of we had a lot of awards. AJ knows we had a lot of awards over the years, and that was fun. I enjoyed that. Uh, you know, behind me, I got a couple. I don't know if you can see that's my neck killing me. So I can't really turn my neck very far. But are you okay? Yeah, but I got a couple game balls back here on the shelf. I got one from. Uh, 
It's a 50,000 yard ball that they gave me last year. So. What do they do? What do they do? That's so far, dude. That is so far. You know, 150,000 feet, bro. Good for you, man. Hey, uh, what's up with your neck? Are you all right? I was about to say, how's the body feel? I was going to ask about the arm because the arm is always in question because that is what you are so prolific at. How's the arm feel? How's the body feel? You can't even turn around and stare at your trophies. Is everything okay? I mean, what the fuck is going on? Are we all right? Yeah, the arm is fine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. It was a great reminder for me that even when something seems like a good idea, might not be in the moment. I threw a pass. I kind of double clutched the pass. I was trying to get the ball out to the flat. Both had knocked up in the air. And the ball was just up there floating. I was thinking, oh, yeah. well, it'll be good. I wasn't thinking the right thing. The right thing would have been, knock this shit down. <laughs> but I was thinking, ooh. I could catch this and maybe get some yards. <laughs> so I caught that thing, took about one step and got ear hold. And uh, <laughs> my neck, uh, my neck is definitely a little locked up. Now, big, big shout out to uh, shout out to, to Doctor Zoli. Um, for years, we didn't travel. People trying to call me. They don't know it's fucking McAfee too. <laughs> yeah, what's the deal? <laughs> Come on, dude. We're getting a medical I'm breakdown. Call. I'm in the middle of a story. Call when AJ's talking. <laughs> uh, no, but a big shout out to, to Dr. Zoli for uh, giving me a little crack at halftime. Shout out. But, uh, yeah, next a little sore from that. Uh, good reminder. Don't catch the ball. Knock it down. Just let it yeah. bounce. You're not built. You know, you're not built for that. Nobody's built to take those shots. But I, since you already spit in Collins' face, look, it, basically, it, it, you know, what you did with the ball, the, the game ball thing. You're gonna throw it in the stands. We're on to Pittsburgh now, right? I don't know if you know this, but Diggs has a great theory on what's going on in Pittsburgh. I don't know if he'll share it with you, maybe in a little bit. But what do they look like, man? We don't know. Week one, they were getting after the quarterback like gangbusters, looking great, and now we're not really sure what they're doing. What's your deal? What's your deal? How do they look, man? What's the Am gameplay look the, like? Am I going to hear the theory first? Oh, no! <laughs> no. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can tell you. Yeah, you got it. Please, Diggs. Uh, once again, the opinions expressed by the COVID cowboy do not reflect that of his peers, employer, or Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, yeah. Aaron, and Aaron, I don't need a reaction from you on the theory. I just think that since Ben... Roethlisberger has found Jesus. His his play has seemed to decline a little bit, and I'm not blaming Jesus. I'm ah, just well, I'm just connecting well. dots here. That's a theory that AJ wanted you to hear. I don't need you to comment on that. Just a good luck this weekend, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> what? It goes many layers deeper than yeah, that. Yeah, there's way more. <laughs> Keep on going, Tony. No, no, that's good. Nobody no, wants we, to hear we, that on we, air. We don't need any bulletin days. board material, all right? That's right. We don't need right. any of that. But Steelers' defense is obviously one that is always going to be good. Your thoughts going into the weekend? Have you started preparation? And, you know, just city of Pittsburgh as a whole, do you have any feelings about that? Uh, yes, I've been around a lot of Pittsburgh people over the years. And I've loved my time with all of them. I've learned to speak the language really well, which has actually allowed me to uh, to follow and become a big fan of Pittsburgh Dad. If you haven't seen <laughs> that on Twitter, uh, big shout out. Um, some incredible, incredible, incredible videos um, that for someone, if you, whether you, you live in Pittsburgh, you live in Pennsylvania, you know somebody from Pittsburgh, you just you appreciate the video so much because you know people who talk like that, who uh, you know enunciate like that, and uh, you know that was my most of my career with Mike in the headset. You know, was trying to figure out what the hell he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to dice right down her. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I didn't even think about that. That's amazing. But it's a great, you know, it's a great blue collar town. There's a lot of. Uh, you know, a lot of great people that live there. It's got a lot of history, that city. Um, Mike Tomlin, you know, been there forever. One of the – is he second longest tenured head coach in the league after Bill? I believe so, yeah. Second or yes. third, yeah. Pete Carroll? Uh, no. Peyton. No, Sean Peyton? Peyton. Uh, but I have a ton of respect for Mike. I think he's a fantastic coach. I think he's – I love the way that he leads. I love the way he talks after the games. He always seems to keep things, uh, you know, really even keeled. And you know, it looks like he's somebody that the players players love playing for him. So they, you know, they've had a great defense. It's been a part of Pittsburgh uh, 
the franchise for a long, long time is is, uh, is great defense. They lost a couple guys uh, in the off season, but um, but I don't know. I mean, it, there's there's anomaly games. This is early in the season. We you know we're when you guys are overreacting on Mondays and people are crowning you know MVPs and offensive players of the year, defense player of the year for a long time. Um, you know TJ had you know, TJ got hurt in week two against the Raiders and then didn't play this last week. Uh, he's you know one of the top. I don't know, can I say two or three at the most uh, defensive players in the league? So having him back is total game changer uh, if he comes back this week, which I'm expecting him to. So, um, you know, and they're they're one and two right now. I'm coming off a tough divisional loss. Um, you know, that seems like a dangerous football team, so we're going to be ready to go. Okay, and you guys are obviously a buzzsaw coming out of Santa Clara. I can't wait to watch that game. Last question for you here on this Aaron Rodgers Tuesday before we debut the new book for the Aaron Rodgers Book Club. You said, how could you not be romantic about football? You don't just say something like that without having thought about it in the past. What did you mean by that? And is it because just how great the game is? Is that why you said that? Or how have you thought to that point of about how romantic, how you get romantic about football? I've never heard that word used, I don't think, to describe football by anybody. So I'm excited to hear why you chose to use that word. Well, that, that was definitely spur of the moment, but it was something that I thought about. I was watching uh, Moneyball nice. the other day. And great movie uh, with, uh, with Brad Pitt. I mean, how about Billy Bean? You know, you joke with your buddies sometimes sitting around like, who would you want to play you in a movie? And Billy's like, yeah, fucking uh, Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a pretty good deal, right? Uh, and what about Jonah Hill? Yeah, and, and, and Jonah as well. I'm not sure if the other guy, you know, the guy. Is- <laughs> <laughs> fucking Jonah Hill. More than Brad Pitt. That was the whole thing. Uh, we don't need to bury Jonah, okay, no. to put over Brad Pitt, AJ. Just, Asshole, let him finish. He's a great his- actor. as a compliment, bro. I, Settle I, down. I agree, but what, I mean, I love Jonah Hill. You ever Hill. seen War Dogs? Hey, you yeah, ever seen I Accepted, dude? It. You ever seen him in Accepted? Ooh. He's fucking awesome. Ask me about that. <laughs> Sorry, but anyways, go ahead. What were they asking him about? Oh, the romantic about football. You're watching. Uh... Now, what were they asking Jonah Hill about in Accepted? I can't remember. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, yeah, well, you do remember. I mean, yeah, we, can, my wiener. Yeah, we can go, we can go. All right, yeah. Jonah's fucking awesome. It's, we've totally lost track, man. We're just all over the place. Yeah, you can be romantic about comedy as well, I guess. But football <laughs> is something that I didn't expect to hear that from you, and it was, I feel like... At, uh, at the end of the movie, right? At the end of the movie, you know, Billy Bean has gone to, to Boston to, you know, he gets offered the GM job, right? And he's coming back, and he's disappointed. They lost in the first round of the playoffs, and... After everything, you know, they won with 22 straight or 23 straight, uh, you know, after, you know, they didn't implement what he was trying to do and then he traded a bunch of players away and you know, all the stuff that happened. And basically the last scene is Jonah showing him a clip uh, of, you know, uh, a player in their farm league thinking that he, you know, he was trying to get the second on a double and slid back in the first, and the whole thing is he just hit a home run. He had no idea he did a home run, you know, because he was so scared about um, about getting out. And the, what hits him in the moment, what hits you as a viewer in the moment, is perspective and how important perspective is in life. And you will be affected, your attitude-wise, your focus, your happiness, by what you focus on. So if you focus on what you don't have all the time, you'll always be in a state of disappointment and dissatisfaction. If you focus on the amazing things in your life all around you at all times, Hmm. that should definitely, in my opinion, lead to a happier life because you're never thinking about what you don't have. You're counting your blessings about the amazing things that you do have in your life. Hmm. And I said that not just as a metaphor because I love football um, and I love nights like that. But the metaphor in it is that if we focus on the blessings and the amazing things going around, going on around us at all times. Naturally, our life is going to be more full of love and happiness and joy. And um, just it kind of hit me in the moment. It was perfect timing for that comment. Yeah, I think so too. And as soon as I heard it, damn! All right. And then the internet did the same thing. And uh, I think we're at a perfect time right now for the world come full circle and me to count my blessings that I'm reading all these goddamn books. Hell yeah! <laughs> I mean, I'm not the only one, Aaron. Okay, I'm not the only one, AJ, that maybe had never. 
you know, thought about reading a book again, you know, or maybe even having a book in our lives now that the internet exists and other things like that. But this Aaron Rodgers book club has got me back into the books and into the pages and turning the pages. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is time, I believe, for the fourth installment of the Aaron Rodgers book club. Drum roll, please. The first one was Alchemist. The second one, Where Men Win Glory. The third book was The Giver, a beautiful book about perspective. This week's book in the Aaron Rodgers Book Club will be... Chuck Norris Can't Be Stopped. Yeah! 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 No, that's not it, actually. That's not it. <laughs> I found this book on the shelf, though. Um, <laughs> it has a 400 uh, all-new facts about the man who knows neither fear nor mercy. So that's uh, an honorary... Uh, title that will add to it but uh you know in in full transparency the book that i wanted for week four i could not find in the entire house so i don't know if uh oh, no. we, I, we can google it yeah uh so no no, no. so that'll i'll find it for another week down the line it's a fantastic book it'll be in the in one spot but i just i bumped up the week five book uh or, you know or the, the fourth the fifth book to the fourth book and this is a book that was really important to me in my uh, early journey into the idea of spirituality and, and um, wanting to uh, to better myself, and I'd heard of Ram Dass before. Uh, people talk about Ram Dass and some of his quotes and philosophy, um, but I didn't know his story, and until I read uh, "Be Here Now," let me hold this up here. Oh, oh. Can you see that whole thing? Yeah, remember, 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 remember. Yeah, well, that's not the, the that's, you remember to be here now is the whole point. Uh, but it's a story of, uh, of Richard Alpert, um, who was a professor in the 70s. And he was trying to, this is not really a, a spoiler alert, he was trying to uh, figure out kind of the meaning of life. And him and somebody started doing some uh some LSD, right? And good way to find out. I've and heard, their I've whole heard. life perspective kind of changed. Uh, but you know, long story short, he goes over to India and uh, realizes that they have something over there, this peace, this understanding, without ever taking any type of hallucinogen, uh, you know, uh, anything. And he wants that. Um, he wants that presence, that calmness, that enlightenment that he sees in these people who don't need to take uh, any stimuli to get there. Huh. And it's a good intro book, uh, I think, for anybody interested in uh, needing inspiration on their journey uh, to a new type of spirituality. Uh, some incredible quotes in here. And, and a book that uh, that really meant a lot to me. Ram Dass actually passed away a couple years ago. Not Ram no, no, Maybe not even two years ago now, but uh, there's a great documentary about him that's out there. And, um, you know, people that love him and his foundation still puts up a lot of great uh, inspirational quotes and, and stuff uh, uh, on Instagram and, and social media. I wanted to have a moment of silence for <laughs> Ram Dass there, but you were in the middle of your sentence, so I felt bad. And AJ, and I mean, I felt like I disrespected the man. Cannot wait to read the book. Remember, be here now. Be where your feet are. Let's live a little, huh? Let's let's appreciate life a little bit more. And I can't thank you enough for uh, reminding me to read The Giver again. You know, last week, and I can't wait to get into Ram Dass' here. Remember, be here now, dude. This is awesome. <laughs> okay, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I can't wait. I, I just hope you read, you know, whatever it is. I don't know when your off season is because you hustle so much. You don't have to take a damn day off. But thank you. Thank you. I just hope at some point you read one of those books or your wife reads it to you in bed, you know, when you're having your pillow talk or something, just so you can, you, you know, you can digest it more than, than Connor's, you know, cliff notes. Or whatever. Well, I, I, Connor, I mean, the giver I read in fifth grade or whatever, so I mean, that was easy to pull, and then obviously the alchemist. My wife, big time reader, though, maybe that is how I get into this thing, through her beautiful voice and your incredible recommendation, sir. I can't thank you enough for joining us. Good luck this weekend against the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, and enjoy the hell of your Tuesday, man. Let's loosen up that neck a little bit, you know? Ooh, I'll try, man.
I'll try. And keep playing guitar, too. That was really inspirational. Hey, you want hey, to play something? You want to play something right here? Yeah, play a duet, guys. Come yeah, on. come on. Yeah, play a little something on the outro, right? Uh, yeah. Recreate that sweet Fox, uh, Fox Sports interview. Yeah, yeah. on right. the beach. Here we go. All right, ready? Hey, play, jump, hey, play Jumper. You got to sing. Oh! You almost showed his screen, too, huh? That was your fault, AJ. AJ, hey, if you would have just shut lot, up, AJ. we could have had a fucking duet, dude. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, he was definitely going to play and sing. He was? Well, until you brought up that commercial. Jeez. You ever heard, have you ever heard him play and sing? He'll do it. He does it. I listened to that. I watched that one piece that he did on the beach or whatever. He's pretty good. I wish I was there at that open mic night. They got oh. booed. Oh, man. That would have been insane. Brought yeah. the house down. All right, we have to get to a break. Like, actually have to right now. We'll be back on the other side to chit-chat about everything that happened there with Aaron. He said a lot of words. Mm -hmm. Put over Pittsburgh pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It seems like he's going there next year. Okay, so there he digs once again, planning for the future with a new quarterback. Wow. This is the second quarterback in less than 24 hours that he has proclaimed going to the Pittsburgh Steelers. That should be a little bit of a sign of worry, maybe, for the Pittsburgh Steelers fan base. I'm not 100% sure. Adrian.